Before we get to WWE Raw this uh, past week, of course, they had an announcement on the show, but it had broken a few days earlier, and we were recording, so we didn't get a chance to talk about it. So why don't we talk about the passing of Sid Udy, a.k.a. Sid Vicious, Sid Justice, Psycho Sid with a very unique spelling, all to himself. What do you think? Obviously, someone you were around since almost the beginning of his career, and with the news of his passing, one of the clips people love sending around is when he was revealed to be the partner of Ahmed Johnson and Shawn Michaels in split screen, and you had a little bit of a meltdown. Yes, and actually, that was the... You, if you can imagine the state of the WWF at that point in time when, when Sid was the more stable alternative to the ultimate warrior who had just gotten fired and was supposed to be in that spot, right? And the thing, ever since this happened, I've been, because we've told so many stories about Sid on the show at, at various points over the years, and the problem is, in, in this instance, possibly some of those might not be in good taste, because it, the biggest stories about Sid were him no-showing, or holding somebody up, or getting in heat with the office. It It was... But then when you saw Twitter with the outpouring of the clips and the, you know, people talking about him, the fans, it was, it was two different worlds. If you had to work with him in a promotional or a, a office, administrative, creative, booking, production, you know, type of scenario, it was, it was fucking bloody murder. But the fans loved him, and he got over pretty much instantly whenever he, you know, started appearing somewhere because of the look and the intensity and the athleticism. So the fans loved him, but at the same time, all of the industry stories center around, you know, the softball Sid thing. And it said, so how do we carry on with this today and discuss him. Well, I think we can look at it from both perspectives. You from the person who had to deal with him as a wrestling executive and as a co-worker, and me as someone who, when I discovered the NWA, one of the first guys I was a mark for was Sid Vicious. He had the coolest entrance music. If he wrestled, sometimes Spivey wouldn't get in the ring. No, yeah. <laughs> he had an aura. I mean, I know it's such a corny word to use, but he had an aura around him that not too many other people did. He also did things that heels didn't typically do in terms of almost asking the crowd to cheer. You know, he would move, make those yeah. little hand <laughs> movements and the crowd would go nuts for him because here's a guy six foot nine doing all these big power moves, killing everyone, and then turning to the crowd to celebrate. Yeah, and he's built like a Greek god, you know, with that physique and at the same time he can do a nip up. And Because, you know, I'll give you an example. I'm nine years old, right? And well, right now or... At one time. Maybe mentally. But in 1989, and at the bash, it's the skyscrapers against the dynamic dudes. Yes, that's what I was going to bring up, but go ahead. And they're almost cool to a nine-year-old, you know? They got surfboards, and they're wearing neon. <laughs> you know, like, that's what's supposed to hit with a kid. You would almost want to root for them. How are you going to root for them against Sid Vicious? Yes. And the Baltimore fans... I mean, that was kind of the reaction a lot of wrestling fans had to Sid, despite limitations in the ring and problems dealing with him. That was the kind of reaction he always got. And the thing is, they would boo Spivey. When Spivey was in a red boo, they wanted to see Sid. Yeah. When Spivey got in a red, Sid, Sid. And then he'd tag and they'd fucking blow. <laughs> and the dudes were goddamn burnt toast. Uh, but th that was the thing. Uh, remember, they had to edit the WWF. You know your uh, New York history better than I do. What was the pay-per-view? Well, it was the Royal Rumble, but what year where? 92. Hulk eliminated. No, Sid eliminated Hulk, and then Hulk held on to Sid and pulled him out, and they booed Hulk. It's the year Ric Flair won. Maybe the greatest Rumble ever. The last three are Flair, Sid, and Hogan. And if you're a fan of WCW or the NWA, you know there's a little bit of a history with the two former horsemen, but they don't really talk about that there. But it's intriguing. Sid eliminates Hogan. The fans cheer. That was the big moment where finally 
it showed that people were kind of sick of Hogan's act because it had gotten really, you know, corporatized. It was yeah. just, yeah. you know, when at the very beginning and, you know, he was kind of like a big wild steroid man. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it was just, he was a bullshit artist to a lot of kids. And Sid eliminates Hogan, the fans cheer. And then Hogan from the outside of the ring just grabs on the Sid and starts pulling at him, which is a total <laughs> heel move. If you Yeah, really sore loser. It. Yeah. And then Flair, the true heel, gets behind Sid and dumps Sid out of the ring while Hogan's doing that. And Sid's mad at Hogan. By the time that aired on TV, they edited it so that the fans were cheering Hogan for some unknown reason. <laughs> In that ordeal, there was no reason to cheer him. But, you know, that that's, again, he could make an impact like that. And he's another guy that, you know, it, it, he hit at the right time, you know, with the explosion in television and et cetera of, of that period. And, you know, everybody had video. His career really, what was it, 13 years, 14 years between his first matches in Memphis and the leg injury. And I mean, he wrestled a few times after that, way after that. But but everybody thinks he, you know, he just, he's always been, oh, Psycho Sid, or Sid Vicious. And there were so many breaks in between when he would just go home. But yet they would kept giving him chances and he would go in and get over. But then he would do something to get himself under with the company and he'd be gone again. And so that's why it was the, you know, the, the, the difference between trying to work with him in the ring where, you know, they're cheering the wrong people and or he, you know, doesn't want to sell whatever or he doesn't want to, you know, do this or that except when he did or working with him as the promoter or the booker where you're trying to make plans and what the fuck, is, you know, when are they playing softball? But the fans, every time that he would go out there and do his shit, they fucking loved it. Can you imagine how good he must have been at softball? He's like Aaron Judge. He's gigantic. He would just be popping him all over the place. I don't know what was... I never saw him play softball, but I heard about it all the time. Did Lawler? Um, oh, I'm sure that uh, Lawler's seen him play. I don't know... <laughs> if he if he's played him or had him on his team or whatever, but there there I'm sure there had to be conversation between the king and Sid on softball. But that was the thing in in um, WCW I guess in early '91. They si heard signed him to a new deal, had to have him, and what Sid had asked for was, I think four hundred grand a year guaranteed. Which what's that from 1990? one now of uh, you know maybe a million in today's money for but 400 grand a year he wanted the world title and he wanted softball season off and they gave him the the money and the world title they just didn't, didn't give him softball season off and i what well, they, they didn't give him the world title i thought they did he didn't get it until years later oh that's right that's right because he didn't make it on that deal long enough i don't think to softball season or was it was that when he quit for softball season? That's when he ends up going to sign with the WWF in 1991, and the last match he has for WCW is a stretcher match against El Gigante. Oh, where he didn't go out on the stretcher. Yeah, he just walked out. <laughs> he didn't go out on the stretcher. <laughs> that was his goodbye to WCW, that match. And that's, and you, you know, know, that's that's one of those early examples. And again, I'm not saying he was Tiger Mask or anything, but... Fans like me were into Sid because he had that aura and that personality that not too many other guys had. He's one of the first examples of someone, although people look back on the Sid Justice run now and they like it, I think it's one of the early examples of Vince not getting how to use someone right out of the gate who came over from WCW, actually. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I agree with you there. And uh, Sid, how long did Sid Justice last? The The name, oh. the whole... Well, he started, he was there at SummerSlam, but I think maybe the month before. So let's say July, June, July, 91. And then he left, he quit right when he was about to work the big program with him and the Ultimate Warrior, which would have been amazing. <laughs> Coming out of WrestleMania 8, let's say May of 92. Oh, it, it just seems shorter. 
But yeah, I mean, see, here we are. We're talking. Yeah, he did this and then he quit, or he did this and then he got hurt, and then he did this and he quit, and he left and went to the other place. But he didn't like it. Was, and I've told the story before. I apologize if everybody's memorized the entire catalog of the YouTube channel. But that time in San Antonio, when they brought him back in '97, when they uh, fired, well, no, it was that '96 when they fired the Warrior. Whatever the case. It was the goddamn San Antonio, the Joe and Harry Freeman Coliseum, because I remember I was so hot that I was ill and almost threw up by the time I got back to the hotel room. It was like 110 in San Antonio that day. And Vince had insisted he come. He'd been off because he was injured, and Vince had me call him. And I called and got his wife because he was out. He was playing softball, or he... He took the softball team to Osceola or somewhere in Arkansas. <laughs> and I said, Vince wants him, you know, at, at Raw Monday night, he doesn't have to wrestle. He knows he's hurt, but he's got to make an interview appearance and do part of this deal, right? Oh, he's not going to like that. He hasn't had time to train lately. He, he doesn't feel, well, I said, he, he's not wrestling. How bad could he look in a fucking month? I'm thinking to myself. We haven't seen him in a fucking month. How? What could he have deteriorated to? And she said, you know, Sid's often said that he, he thought he might be happier if he went back to selling farm chemicals. I don't know whether she's trying to just pour her heart out to me or negotiate with me on his behalf, like, you better give him more money. He might go back to selling farm chemicals. <clears throat> and I, I said... I said, nevertheless, Vince wants him there. He sent him a plane ticket, Monday, San Antonio. He's going to do this interview thing, right? So he shows up. And I can't even remember the particulars, but the four top baby faces, whoever they were at this point in time, it was Michaels, is whoever the fuck, they all come out on the stage and confront the group of heels in the in the ring. And Sid is one of them. And he... He didn't take his shirt off. He's dressed in street clothes. He didn't take his shirt off because he he felt like he hadn't tanned. I'm like, Jesus Christ. And then they were supposed to come back at the top of the hour, seg seven, and that was when Raw was a two-hour show, and do some kind of run-in and whatever and pay the thing off. And we started looking around for, where's Sid? And we asked Bruno, you know, RV Whippleman, downtown Bruno. Because they went back to the Memphis days. And that was his manager, Sid Justice. Yes. And and we said, where's where Sid? Oh, he he came up to me. He said he he felt like he was having a heart attack. I said, well, where'd you take him? I took him back to the hotel. What? The Holiday Inn for a heart attack? <laughs> he said he just wanted to go back to the hotel. It was so hot. Yeah, I'm like, what the fuck? Oh, geez. So he, and he didn't make that segment. And that's when... Oh, God damn it. Was it him that Vince said, if I'm going to prorate your appearances, or was it Warrior? Maybe it might have been both of them. Both these things may be true. But I don't, he, I don't know. He wasn't around long again after that. You know, that's sad to hear that. I didn't even put two and two together about him selling uh, farm chemicals, because I guess one of the things that they're attributing his passing to is the exposure to Roundup. Oh, good lord. Are you kidding? No, I read that. So I thought it was just from, you know, I, I, again, I missed it. Okay, I, I had not I had not read that. So I wasn't trying to be flippant, as they say. Yeah. Wow. Uh, well, uh, who would have thought he got out of wrestling and it killed him? You know, he's an underrated promo. You may not like his style, but he was, and I don't know if he always made sense. But there was an intent. Again, no one had this intensity. He yes. had certain intangibles that no one else had, and he made it work for him. He no, he was a perfect promo. Except if he had to go too long or explain. One of the guys, there's a lot of guys like this. If they have to go too long or explain too much detail, it it robs them of their intensity because they get lost or they just get uh, hesitant, as I just was. And that's why if you have the little manager to fill in the the details and do the fucking bridges amongst this monster having short, violent, verbal outbursts like he could do tremendous, 
that's that's your key there. And, but I, one time again on on one of the promos, it didn't even matter, like you said, whether it made sense because it sounded so real that he was saying it. He actually he did a promo, and I can't remember what it was, but some way or another, he he told the people in in some twisted syntax that he was half as smart and and half as bright as oh, yeah. uh, big as his opponent or whatever in wcw yeah it caused scott hall to start laughing at him in the middle of the ring yes but you know but again it's fucking sid and everybody thought he was goofy and out of his mind and because he party was goofy and out of his mind he went from screaming to whispering better than anyone like you know yeah. he was able to ah! And I'll tell you, like, and then he would all of a sudden become Jake Roberts like, and lean in and you would see his eyes and, you know, it worked. What was up with Vince's spelling of psycho? Uh, I think it was something he wanted to try to trademark or just to, you know, have some alliteration there. With the SS, Psycho Sid, not SS in terms of connotation of Germany, but just uh, alliteration on the on his logo. Let me tell you about my favorite Gestapo. <laughs> well, now that may that may have come later, but uh, <clears throat> but yeah, it, it was just the the alliteration, and so they could trademark the you know action figures and et cetera, et cetera. But that partially came from. Because I, you know, when I heard from Vince and Bruce, yeah, we're bringing Sid. I said he's fucking, he's a psycho because of the thing that had happened with Arn. And there, and Vince comes up, oh, and it, you know, changes the spelling, or whatever. Oh, you, he almost died, you say? Let me. How can I use this? Yes. How can I? Yes. Yeah, so e, 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 e. I'm surprised they they didn't license that music from fucking Bernard Herman. Now that I'm thinking about his music, did his music have like a fake psycho sound at the beginning? Yes, yes. I never even thought about that before. Wow. Yes, that's the goddamn deal. But they should have just gone all the way with it. Like I played the theme from Halloween for the Mongolian Stomper. Play the fucking shower music. I like Sid better in the mid-90s when he returned to the look without the mullet that he had when he first hit in 1989. <laughs> I didn't like him with long hair as much. Well, it and it made him look taller when he had shorter hair. That's right. I liked him with Shawn Michaels. You know, everyone talks about Shawn Michaels and Diesel. I thought he was really good as Shawn Michaels' bodyguard. Well, and and again, that formula works when you know when both guys do their thing. But that's why Vince McMahon was so sold on Sid multiple times because he looked so good, and Vince knew he could just. Like Donald Pleasance in Halloween, if he could just reach him, you know. But the, but he found out that those those eyes were soulless. Uh, he couldn't keep him under control in the, from blowing up, from having issues, whatever, to fully monetize him. And that's the thing they they threw from nineteen eighty nine through nineteen ninety what eight. Or nine with WCW. Yeah, maybe a little bit after that, yeah. A little bit or two thousand. They threw money at him. He would, he'd quit, leave, go home, get mutual split, whatever the fuck. All the incidents. Get fired for the thing with Arn. And he'd sit at home for a while, and then the other when the heat was off the other side because of there was something there. They would get him. And then some would happen again. So he could have been much bigger and for a longer period of time because there were so many breaks in that period of time. Well, that's a sad transition right there. What I was going to say is, you know, when he passed, a couple of the matches that came to my mind were the dudes match. And I posted the link to the Lee Scott match, which is just amazing. Because <laughs> the crowd starts coming alive with each destruction of Lee Scott. And the match with Sean at the Garden for Survivor Series in 96, where the fans turned on Sean, yeah. Sid became the biggest babyface in the world that night. Unfortunately, one of the memories a lot of people have, and I try not to think about it, to be honest with you. It makes me sick, the image of it. Sid Vicious breaking his leg in Ugh. WCW. What was your reaction when it happened? What did you think when you heard or saw it? Well, I wasn't watching live but heard about it and then saw the tape and that is just, but eh, 
And he had said later on and ended up suing WCW because they said, do this. But at the same time, why would you tell this guy to do that? Because the one thing about Sid, the entire massive body, he had kind of some bird legs down, down below there. But that was nothing that he had ever done. It wasn't important, as I remember, just coming off the second rope with a kick to a guy. How can that be an integral part of a finish? So I don't know if he ever won any money because could he prove that they insisted he do that? And he said, no, I, I can't do that kind of stuff. Did he get a big settlement? Did, was this reported? I actually don't know. I do know that most people who sued WCW ended up happy in the end, but I don't know. Uh... Well, WC... WCW wasn't giving out happy endings when I worked for them. I might have stuck around. They were giving out settlements. You sue them. They didn't want... To... I mean, how many people sued just because they knew they would get a settlement out of WCW? No, I know, I know, but they cer certainly weren't giving out any happy endings. No, no. Well, you don't know what Jim Hurd and Jim Ross were doing late at night at the bar. Hey, now, come on! You don't. You weren't there. Or the bourbon for Hurd and. <laughs> well, uh... but anyway, but nevertheless, but yeah, that when that injury, leg injury to Sid, pretty much ended his full time career, and he came back long after that to do just a you know few matches. But, but yeah, I I didn't ever understand that deal from either side why that they would insist and. And here's the thing, we couldn't get Sid to agree to come to work. We were paying him a half million dollars a year. Why would he agree to jump off the fucking ropes on one leg for somebody? What the fuck was going on there? Well, that was uh, our look at the life of Sid. <laughs> I can't even say it because of the way you ended that. But Well, no, but I mean, not even being disrespectful, but he picks then to ag agree to do something. I, I don't know. But again, a memorable character from the 1990s, one of the more memorable wrestlers of the decade in a lot of ways because he was in both companies on various occasions and had big runs at the top and often just disappeared or was fired or was sent home for... I mean, it was a variety of things. Well, and he would go back to Memphis and work for Lawler because he, he lived in West Memphis, Arkansas, so and that's where he started Lord Humongous was uh, at first it was Mike Stark a long time ago in Memphis, and then Jeff Van Jeff Camp. Van Camp, who, yeah. He he broke in here. He played football for the U University of Louisville, and then uh, you know when they wanted to bring the gimmick back, they put it on Sid, and he was the most impressive looking of of the bunch. And then when the people found out it was him, point is, whenever he would. He would be gone from WCW or WWF, but he'd show up in Memphis. And those people would say this international star for the next three weeks. And then he'd go somewhere else. Do you think it was worth maybe looking into, like, having, like, a, a tour? Not the Lex Express, but, like, Sid going town by town. Whatever town he's going to wrestle in, he takes on your softball team during the day. <laughs> like, if you know you have this guy that can hit bombs, put him in there against every schlub in town. To promote the wrestling event. Yeah, but, you know, it, it might have ended up like George Goulas when he had the uh, the wrestlers form the basketball team so he could be the captain, and they would go and, and play the local high school team in the school that they were having the matches in that night. They'd have a ball game, and they'd set up the ring during intermission, and then they'd have the wrestling. But one night in Rabbit Ridge, Kentucky, the fucking high school team beat the wrestlers, and George got so mad, he canceled the matches. What? Are you serious? I never heard that yes. before. Bob Eaton told me that one. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. That's amazing. Yeah, he said they cheated. <laughs> it was some referee call or whatever that he felt they had been wrong. Did he? No, we're not. No, take the ring back. We're not doing it. Daddy, they cheated. That's nuts. I never heard that story before. But there you go. But Sid. That was it. The uh, life of uh, Sid.